can DeAndre Hopkins keep it up that and more this week on the couch joined by Jacob Gibbs to answer all the tough questions uh, the toughest coming out of week 10 DeAndre Hopkins league winner are we there I think we just might be he looked so good um I will admit that I have some bias I'm a, a Kansas City Chiefs fan born and raised living in Kansas City currently um so uh, I was excited to see DeAndre Hopkins play so well, but man, he seems to really be making the most of his opportunity. And I think he's only going to continue to get more every time he threw the ball, he came down with it. And then it uh, all culminates into that just heroic catch and triple coverage, the crazy play from Mahomes. Um, if you want some numbers, um, that's, you know, I know a lot of people, that's what they expect from me. 25% target per route run rate, 15% first down per route run rate. That is really elite. 2.4 yards per route run is what DeAndre Hopkins is sitting at so far with the Chiefs. Um, he had a 28% first read target rate last week, which I thought was really encouraging because that's not a per route stat. That's he had 28% of the entire team's chunk of first read targets, even though he's not quite in a full time role yet. So I think sky's the limit here. He looks great. Yeah, I feel like maybe I overthought this one. You know, I, in hindsight, it's so easy to see the path to telling people as soon as a trade happened, go, go, go. And then they even told us, look, I don't associate DeAndre Hopkins as like a zone beater. You know, I mean, he's he wins contested catches, right? Mm -hmm. And he's the guy who can win in, in close spaces. I don't associate him with the kind of stuff Roshi Rice and Juju Smith-Schuster were doing earlier this year. So when they said they were going to put him in that role, like, oh. You know, they only gave up a fifth round pick for him. And same that Mike Williams got. Blah, 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 what? Um, and he's, you know, he was hurt. He had that knee. He's playing through. He's on, on getting to the end of his career. But the reality is that uh, give Patrick Mahomes a smart, experienced receiver, and they're going to make hay. And it was beautiful, Jacobs. Did you see the interview after the game with DeAndre? Oh, Hunter? yeah. It yeah. really did look like he was going to cry. Yeah. Like tears of joy. They were yeah. asking, like, how does it feel? And you can tell that he's like, this is football, man. Like, we're playing, I'm finally got a quarterback I need to just play football with. Because, mm. like you said, that catch, the emblematic catch is that catch um, in triple coverage. And you can just imagine Patrick Mahomes. I, I wish I could do a Patrick Mahomes impression, you know, <laughs> like, okay, no, okay, I'm running. But you just got to keep running. So, and whatever. I can't do it. Like, he's got gravel in his throat. I can't do it. But you can just hear in your in your mind Patrick Mahomes to tell him, like, you know, that's how we do it, right? Just be, if I'm going, you just keep going. Just don't, you know, I'm, I'm going to get you. And he did it. Right. Yeah. I mean, you know, it's like he, they were able to finish each other's sentence. Right. <laughs> Patrick yeah. was like, I'm going to get hit. I'm going to throw it in between these three guys. You're going to run in be these, between these three guys and you're going to catch it. And that's beautiful Me football. Go ahead. And meanwhile, Xavier Worthy continues to oh. overrun everything, you know, and only gets two targets in the game. Doesn't, it doesn't get imbalanced on either one of them. And yeah, I think yeah. everything, the, the timing has worked out perfectly where it, it would not be any surprise if like he's really leaned on here down the stretch run for the Chiefs. Yeah, I think any trade for Hopkins, especially in Dynasty Leagues, if he's on a team that isn't going anywhere, any trade for Hopkins, I think is going to look like a good trade. And as much as I don't want to see the Kansas City Chiefs win again, sorry, nothing personal. But I get it. Oh, you know, OK, next. Well, you know, before we jump into any other specific topics, because you mentioned it, Jacobs and uh, Jacobs, Jacobs, Jacob, you met, I'm, I'm putting your name into one, one nice, concise word um jacob you mentioned numbers and you gave us a lot of numbers there and and don't get me wrong i i think that all of these numbers are good now not everybody listening might not be able to contextualize and say like 25.8 is that good or that bad i don't i understand what you're saying in the stat but by the time i'm thinking about it we move it on to another sentence but i so i want to ask you this because you do a terrific job follow jacob on twitter x um you do a terrific job just every time I see you on my timeline, I'm, I know I have something good to think about. Like, oh, I'm going to think, I'm going to look at the list. I'm going to think about it, right? Um, tell me of all these stats that you're compiling and comparing and, and staring at every week. Give me one, and it can be like one, one like the stat as a whole when looking at all the NFL, or maybe like you can think of like a specific case where like this stat for this player pointed you in the right direction. Um, like, like something where the stats, like a little, had a little, some stat has a little gleam and it led you to fantasy gold. Yeah, I think the per route data is really important and it can be used in a lot of different ways. So just last year, um, two 
clear wins for me personally in terms of predicting this crazy game um, came through the lens of Parat data. And one of them was Puka Nakua. Um, he wasn't able to put together ever any um, extended run of success at the collegiate level due to a various number of um, circumstantial things, injuries, playing mm -hmm. on a BYU team that just ran the crap out of the ball with Tyler Algier. But all of his underlying information was really, really good. Um, and you don't want to get carried away with trying to extrapolate collegiate parade data to the pros. But it at least offered some suggestion that this player might be really talented. And then he lands in a perfect spot with the Rams. And it's like, I think this is a bet worth placing. The other one was Nico Collins. Um, really strong parade data that got better in his second season. But people just gave him up, assumed he was dead. I literally picked him up in a dynasty league. Someone dropped him oh. going, into, going into last year. And... The Parade data suggested that he was still a really good player and an ascending young player. Um, then he gets, you know, paired with CJ Stroud and he's healthy. And you see the Parade data when he's healthy over a larger sample size turn into something really big. Um, you could, I could go on and on. Like Josh Downs has always had really good Parade data. And now we see him, you know, in a bigger role this year and he's performing really well. Um, so it's, it's great to use with players who have had injuries, who have had seasons interrupted with injuries or whatnot. It's great to use um, with young players, Rashi Rice, um, not in a full role, but his Parat data suggested that when he would be in a full role, he could be a wide receiver one. Um, there's a lot of ways that you can use it, um, but it's also something that, like all stats, you have to make sure to contextualize it. Like there's a ton of things that impact Parat data. When you have more wide receivers on the field, um, then Parat data drops because you're competing right. with right. more competent players for targets um play action affects per route data pre-snap motion per affects per route data so you can't just use it blindly um but i think if you you know familiarize yourself with it and spend more time with it you can really help yourself understand fantasy in a better deeper way um and i think if you follow me if you follow scott barrett you guys had him on last week from fantasy points data i absolutely love the FP data team and all the work they're doing, um, you'll you'll be well on your way to better understanding how to use that information. Yeah, it's all it, to me. It's like um, verification, or, or uh, uh, and just to be clear, when we're talking about per route data, what we really mean is targets per route or production per route, right? Like yeah, or first downs per route run for, rate for, is a really important stat. Ryan Heath, the Fantasy Points data, um, talked about that a lot. Wrote about it this past off season. Did a good job bringing that to the mainstream. That's a good one for um, inflated data, like a big play. A George Pickens yeah. play for 80 yards really affects his yard per route run rate, but it's just one first down. That's um, fair. Yeah. And, yeah and, and this is great. This is a great discussion. Uh, um, statistics. I, you know, Jacob, I'm an old man. I Back in college, in my policy studies uh, program at, at Maxwell in Syracuse, we used to call it the Little Red Schoolhouse back in the 60s, not when I was there. One of the books, actually, the the book title was How to Lie with Statistics. But we're not trying to lie <laughs> with statistics. We're trying to find the truth, right? And, and, it, and this is a nice detailed discussion because uh, in a per route uh, data world, like you said, if you're just looking at yards per data, you're going to weight bigger plays, which, hey, for fantasy, that's actually a pretty good bias. Um, if you're looking at first downs, it's almost like a success rate, but it's success rate for the offense because you mentioned Nico Collins. Part of the reason Nico Collins was a fourth round pick, part of the reason Nico Collins was slept on it because he didn't have good quarterback play. But target per route just means even if the quarterback sucks, this player is important in the offense, you know. When he's out there, they want to throw the ball to him. That might mean he's executing. That might mean they're game planning for him. Whatever. It means he's a good player. Go ahead. Oh, uh, If you want to take it a level deeper, too, you can look at Parat data versus different coverage types and all sorts of different stuff. Like, it's just I have so much fun with it. I probably get a little bit lost in the weeds with it sometimes, but I, I, I enjoy it. I really do. And, and I think it's kind of like a gateway drug to learning a lot more about football and how it all works and how everything yeah. interacts with everything on the field, like how different types of coverages lead to different players getting targets in different ways and all that I, it's fun oh it is i mean that and it's a nice it's a nice language to view the game through and like you said it's like drilling down to this micro 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 level but by understanding isn't this about life and learning right and knowledge by understanding something on a truly micro level then you can start to pan out 
and get a macro picture and see how all of these pieces fit together and and un have a, a larger understanding of what you're looking at. So give me somebody. Let's make this actionable for fantasy, Jacob. Give me somebody right now and an action that someone can take right now based on NFL per route data, something they should do with their fantasy team that this per route data can point you in the right direction. Absolutely. Josh Downs, you just brought up last week that maybe any trade you make for Josh Downs is a win. I love that. Um, I think that might be the case. And maybe you might be able to get him a little bit cheaper this week than last week, even though nothing about last week was discouraging. He actually had his highest first retarget rate um, of any game that he's had this year last week. Uh, it was just, you know, the Colts had the fewest overall plays of any offense last week. So if that normalizes, I think all the per route data on Josh Downs suggests that he's a stud. And with him, it's important to know that he's only running about two thirds of the routes. So don't assume you can just extrapolate these this per route data ranks that I'm about to give you and say he is wide receiver one um, because he's not playing a full game like a lot of the other players that he, I'm going to compare him to are. But on a per route data basis with Anthony Richardson not on the field, Josh Downs is number one wide receiver, number one in targets per route run wide receiver one and first downs per route run. He's really, really important to his offense. Wide receiver six in yards per route run, wide receiver two in fantasy points per route run. Josh Downs is a stud. He's one of my favorite players in the NFL. Yeah, just good, consistent quarterback play. And we're talking, but yeah, it won't be surprising if he eventually levels off, I think as a, a wide receiver one in fantasy. Um, still, I hope so. Bye, bye, bye. bye. A bye, bye, bye. Okay. I've, um, I've got another but, interesting one. Juwan mm -hmm. Jennings. I don't know if Ooh. people realize this. Juwan Jennings, the only players who have averaged more yards per route run than Juwan Jennings without Brandon Ayuk on the field this year are Nico Collins, AJ Brown, and Justin Jefferson. He's been exceptional. And if you look at his career data without Brandon Ayuk on the field, his yard per route run rate is 2.8, which is nearly identical to this year's rate. And that's not necessarily super inflated by this year's data. I think only 15 of those routes came this year. So I think it's possible that this is a player who's just kind of been hidden because mm -hmm. there've been so many other awesome players in San Fran. Anytime they've needed a big play, he's made it. Um, and I think if you look at like fantasy points, data's average separation scores in terms of who's winning down the field, it's been Juwan Jennings more than like Debo Samuel. Um, I love Debo. His parade data is awesome too, especially with Ayuk off the field. I think he's going to really benefit from the absence of Ayuk too. But who's going to fill that role? I think it's Jennings. It's tough because we don't know how healthy he is, but he's coming out of his bye. Hopefully he's feeling yeah. good. And he's been so good this year. Yeah, why you like that one too is that Brock Purdy's in big game hunter mode. And that's he's the big game. The play downfield to him. We had mm -hmm. one of the biggest, one of the biggest wide receiver games of the season was Juwan. Yeah. So uh this is not difficult. And it's wild too watching because um I always go back to watching players in college. Jacob and I I mean you've watched him in Tennessee you had to like his game you know, sometimes like forget about scouting and trying to figure out what role they're going to play is going to be fantasy relevant what round do you go in oh draft capital means this and players weren't drafted in this round with this 40 time and so on and uh, because the reality was he was kind of a, a lumbering big slot when you projected him to the NFL based on his college tape but his college tape you saw a player you saw you know I mean he was a, he was a dog just you know, thought, well, how is this going to apply in the NFL? And that's why, and maybe what we should have understood is while we were all thinking about Brandon Ayuk's extension and all that drama this offseason, they very quietly gave Jawan Jennings, a, a, for Jawan Jennings, you know, a late third day pick, what was it, like two years, 13 million, similar, I think, to the deal that Rashad Bateman got. Isn't that funny? Yeah. How two years, 13 million. And don't quote me on those numbers. My brain is not what it used to be. But it was in, the, right. neighbor, in the neighborhood. You know, if you're Jawan Jennings, two years, 13 million is your first contract after your rookie deal is like, wow. I made it. If you're Rashad Bateman, you're like, I guess I have to settle for this. If I, I want to stay with Baltimore, <laughs> I want to stay with Lamar Jackson. I guess you're not going to give me the fifth year option, which was like 14 or 15 million. Then I guess I'll take this. But that they were telling us we like I know they just drafted Ricky Pearsall, but mm -hmm. they were telling us we like Jawan Jennings. Now, I thought it was more like as a blocker because the slot Eric Stoner who's one of my favorite, favorite football thinkers. I think it was Eric Stoner that said, you know, fullback slot receiver. It gives you an extra gap, extra eligible receiver, extra blocker, you know, and Jawan Jennings can do all those things. Good. You know, you know what I mean? Like he, he's, so I didn't think of him as this guy that was also going to be catching the ball 40 yards downfield. Until he Yo, me either. 
No, when he when he stepped into a role when Debo is out, I was like temper expectations because he's never done it. He's never. I think he. I don't have it off the top, but I think he had only had like maybe one game over 100 yards, um, and only a handful of games over like 50 yards. Like he never been a player who had been productive um, over a uh, you know large sample size. But if you look, if you do zoom in, and there's a, there's a few things that is like maybe maybe this guy's really good, you know? Yeah. Like I, I don't know, and I do think it's really interesting that they that they signed him and gave him that contract, even when they drafted Pearsall, even when they drafted Jacob Cowing, who I, I like both those players yeah. and they seem to as well. They spent decent, you know, at draft equity on them. Um, but yeah, he's, he's pretty exciting. I, I, I hope we see a big game from him this week. I think we just might because, you know, the, that's a potential shootout against the Bucks and teams really go past heavy against the Bucks. Yeah, exactly. That's the thing. Like you want to get Juwan Jennings, get him now. Uh, because Tampa Bay, you know, we see, we saw what happened with, well, we led with Tim DeAndre Hopkins. Maybe it was just Tampa Bay. Um, and going back to it, by the way, 472, 472, Jacob. <laughs> he ran a 472. That's but, wild. But, you know, uh, he's got a little Brandon Marshall. That's my guy. You know, I love it. <laughs> he's got a little Brandon Marshall to his game. Uh, he's... The way he plays when the ball is in the air. Yes, exactly. He's bailed Purdy out on a few plays, and I don't. I think it makes sense that Purdy will continue to trust him on those downfield shots. And Purdy has been pushing the ball down the field. Yeah, he's played well too. I think he's top three in catchable ball rate on deep throws. Um, he's he's scrambling and, and evading yeah. sacks um, much much oh, yeah. higher rate than he's ever done before. And I think the offense is only going to elevate with McCaffrey back. And you look at Vegas implied totals. San Fran sitting at twenty eight. It's the second highest of any team this week. Um, I think it's it's an exciting time to roster any of the 49ers, really. So at this moment, Jacob, on that note, at this moment, are you a, or would you be more likely to tell someone to be a Christian McCaffrey buyer or a Christian McCaffrey seller? I wish I had anything helpful to add. Um, I guess I would say buy. I've gone for it in a few spots when it when it was not super cost prohibitive in Dynasty. Uh, but I, you know. I don't feel good about it. I'm definitely <laughs> terrified. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. I think the answer is, well, I'm, I'm waiting to see about uh, J- Jordan Mason. But mm-hmm. Isaac Correndo becomes interesting. Isaac Correndo becomes interesting just because it seemed like that the light bulb was going on for him running in that scheme going into the bye. And it, so if McCaffrey gets out there and it just doesn't work, uh, you know, McC- Mason's on that second shoulder injury now. I think it was the same shoulder, same injury. And he's just going to keep running the ball the way he runs it. He's just going to keep hurting that shoulder over and over again. So, you know, it's it's time for stashes. It's time for that player that you add in like week 11 that saves you in the playoffs in week 15 is like the reason you end up winning the championship. I wonder if it's going to be Grendo. If you trade for McCaffrey, that can be like your, you know, your pacifier. It's like, well, Grendo could be the league winner. Um is there anything interesting we can say about Kate Otten? I mean, is it just like if you have Kate Otten, you keep playing him as the number one fantasy tight end and, uh, you know, Mike Evans will be back. Mike Evans is back. Uh, and right, you know, you know, per route data, Baker Mayfield says that's the one guy I trust. Yeah. Um, on Kate Otten, he's somebody who I've, I've had a tough time with uh, as a player, as a profile, like he's not somebody who looks exciting he's never been a yardage creator even at the collegiate level i think he topped out at like 370 yards in any of his four season as a college player um his college data or his uh, pro data has not been good um but you have to take into account that he's been sharing the field with some really really productive players and the offense just funnels through those guys um what i would bring up with k Otten is i was hoping we would see an uptick in screens for him um, because the Bucks use a ton of screens. Liam Cohen has has really used screens well, and Chris Godwin was the guy who was seeing all of that. But oh. it's been the running backs who have filled that void, and not Otten so much. Otten has two screen targets of the last two games. He's had two huge games, um, but I oh my goodness, let me shut this door. Yeah, I'll, I'll take the, the I'll take the lead back here on Otten, uh, and you know what you're what you're saying. Uh, Jacob, just to keep the, the answer going here, it's like he doesn't necessarily add value to his targets, but he's been getting a lot of targets. But like you said, not necessarily the targets that have been uh, the targets we like in the Bucks pass offense and really showing that Liam Cohen also sees, yeah, he doesn't really add anything to his targets. Pretty much. Is this still really loud and annoying? We've nope, got you're a... good. Okay, okay, cool. Yeah, I just had like a tornado alarm or something going off here. Um yeah, that's pretty much where I'm at with it. Like he's been really heavily involved, first three targets and all that. But it's also important to bring up that like, even last week they didn't even have Jalen McMillan. So it's like, right. 
they're out of options. They're running, they ran two jet sweeps to Sterling Shepard in the year 2024. Like, of course, Kate Otten is getting a huge workload. Um, I, I think I would be selling him, but I don't really have him anywhere because I've never really believed in him from the first place. Right, right. Um, but yeah, I mean, 50 PPR points over a two-week span, that's pretty good. That's more than Dalton Schultz has all year. Yeah, well, I mean, it's he's he's been winning your week for you um, if you were playing him because he's just Kate Otten. And I, I think for, you know, for Dynasty, he might be a buy just simply because that you don't put necessarily put this back in the bottle. Like, yes, you know, God, will, will Godwin be back? because he's going to free agency. That's also a potentially reason to buy Kate on in Dynasty. And even though Kate on, I actually, I'm going to confess here that I actually dropped Kate on in, in like a short bench Dynasty league or two, maybe even when it was tight end premium, just because like you said, he's kind of an ordinary player, but we've seen in the big enough role in a robust enough pass offense. And now with very little target competition, um, an ordinary player, just it's just, just the sheer number of targets okay i want to bring up somebody that i'm really excited about and you can be i usually mount baldman back in the day was my wet blanket you can be a wet blanket or you can get excited with me because i'm telling people i'm stopping people on the street and they're saying uh why did you stop me and i said because drake may is going to be really awesome in the yes. second half of the year for fantasy football i feel like watching the game last week jacob i thought oh they're just letting him play this is all, I mean, give me some Demario Douglas. Give me some Ramondre Stevenson. Like, they're just going to let him play. This is great. And that's what creates fantasy value. And I think he also looks like he's not overwhelmed by the game. The game isn't moving too fast for him. And that makes me think he's going to even get better as the season goes on. I, I'm excited for the offense that I would have said unequivocally, Jacob, was going to be the worst offense in the league. Now I want to get in. I'm in. Yeah, no, no wet blanket here. I've been uh, talking about Drake May. Any opportunity I get um, had Nate Tyson beyond the box score a podcast that I just started with Dan Schneier a couple weeks ago. And we we just went in on Drake May like it's it's such an exciting time. And they really are letting him play. Last night, I just watched the full game and it's like this is the Drake May show. It's extremely entertaining. Uh, there are times where it's terrifying, you know, I kind of feel <laughs> like Bill Hader in that regard at watching him and, but like, uh, yeah, so, so good. He's averaging 1.9 rushing fantasy points per quarter in 2024. Um, sorry to get so specific, but that's kind of where yeah. we're at. We have a small sample size here. So the only guys above that are Jalen Hurts, Justin Fields and Jaden Daniels, um, Lamar Jackson, Anthony Richardson and Kyler Murray all below that. Mm -hmm. That's rushing fantasy points per quarter. He's second in scramble rate. Only Jane Daniels scrambles more often on a per dropback basis. He's first in avoided tackles per rush, first downs per rush, yards per rush. And this is carried over from the college game. He was extremely proficient as a college rusher as well. And he's been good as a passer. Just a few stats on that. On throws that travel 10 or more yards past the line of scrimmage, Drake May ranks eighth among qualified quarterbacks, 39 qualified quarterbacks in catchable ball rate. He's also top 10 in highly accurate throw rate those are per fantasy points data and those are random you know metrics you might not know if you look at the rest of the top 10 it's a bunch of really really good quarterbacks been playing at a high level this year uh jane daniels number one by the way in catchable ball rate on throws traveling 10 or more yards past the line of scrimmage that is pretty fun caleb williams 39th out of 39 not yeah so yeah oh yeah, that's the 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 mat the the rematch. I always like it when there's Super Bowl rematches. See, were you were you even alive when New England played Chicago in the Super Bowl, Jacob? Probably not. What year? I was born in '94. Oh, geez. Yeah. <laughs> well, my 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 father, Sigmund L. Bloom, would say something like, "You weren't even a gleam in your dad's eye back then." Uh, <laughs> uh, what's up, Dad? It's his birthday. Uh, yeah. Rest in peace, Dad. Happy uh, birthday. Um. So. You know, this is fun this week, though, because Drake May on the way up, Chicago defense, you know, that game, they were just shutting it down by halftime. Caleb Williams limping off the field. Is he Jay Tyson Bajan, maybe, or something by the end of the year? It's so hard week to week. One of the things about fantasy football that where you just start to feel silly, pretending like, I always say we're, we're, um, fake fortune tellers you know we're, <laughs> we're pretending that we can predict the future and that's fine it's as good as i don't I, I own up to it i have no idea what i'm doing i don't know anything right well we don't we don't but then you know i i think i've told this story before about college i was uh, i studied philosophy i dropped out of the newhouse school i love to say that um because i just wasn't interested in broadcast journalism 
and uh, I ended up studying philosophy because uh, there was this professor, Jose Benedetti. I ended up taking a philosophy of math class with him and one philosophy, one math grad student and one high school math teacher who was taking it just because it was interesting. So it was really kind of like a seminar just with this professor and I ended up taking a lot more, including one about Immanuel Kant, uh, the critique of pure reason. And he just had the first day of class. He's like, he said something like, you know, none of us will ever understand what he was trying to say. None of us will ever. <laughs> now let's dive in. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, he always used to say too, like it was back whenever uh, you, know, you could maybe hurt professors, I mean, students feelings a little bit. If, a, if someone would be talking about a concept and they were off, he would say, you're not even in the game. Get, <laughs> get back in the game. Uh, anyway, uh, we, we should get back in the game, even though we're pretending uh, to predict things. Um, should we predict? Because I, I think that we're, it's, everything's always changing in the NFL. And we're going in these these three, four week windows. And we shouldn't assume that what we've seen for the first nine weeks is going to resemble what we see in the next nine, eight for fantasy football. Hopefully you're not playing it in week 18. So what we saw in week nine from Aaron Rodgers and Garrett Wilson and Devontae Adams looked very different than what we'd seen up to that point. And it was against Houston, Texas defense. I know Will Anderson got hurt, but that defense mm -hmm. was pretty hot coming in. I mean, that was not a defense you'd say like, well, yeah, anybody, you know, because we're talking about DeAndre Hopkins, like, well, it was Tampa. So just like we saw Jameis Winston against Baltimore, well, it was Baltimore. Like sometimes you don't say that about Houston. And yet we saw the Garrett Wilson we were hoping for. We saw Devontae Adams looking spry. We saw a few moments of old Aaron Rodgers. This week against Arizona, again, a team that made Kalen Williams look bad, but that's not necessarily an exclusive, exclusive defensive club this year. So are, are, are we bullish on the Jets Take ready, cleared for takeoff? I think you can be. I think that makes some sense. Yeah, the, I, I was really impressed with what we got last week in that matchup. I do think the Will Anderson injury affected things because we saw almost all that production come in the second half. Um, I was really low on the Jets last week because I thought it was a, a horrible schematic matchup for Garrett Wilson in particular. The Texans are really good at preventing um, you know, first read targets and perimeter targets and stuff like that. And it didn't matter. Garrett Wilson just goes up and gets that thing, you know, like yeah. he's just he's just that good. And that's awesome. And we'll see going forward. I'm trying to pull up real quick while you're talking about it. I was curious what Fantasy Points data had to say about week nine in terms of separation, because I know that has not been strong for Devontae Adams this year. They do. They gave a really good separation score to both Gary Wilson and Devontae Adams in week nine. That is exciting because, yeah, during his time with the Raiders, Devontae Adams graded out as literally the worst receiver in the NFL, according to Fantasy Points data in terms of uh, getting separation and then it wasn't great early on with the Jets. And also the Jets were using him in a sort of strange way. He was playing in the slot more than ever before. His average depth of target prior to last week was only like six and a half yards. Mm -hmm. And so to me, I'm like, maybe this is like actually where he's at. Maybe that number with the Raiders is more representative of where he's at than we thought. And maybe it's not just an effort thing, which is the easy way to, you know, just explain that that number with the Raiders. Um, but I think that what we saw last week is really good to get such good separation scores against Lassiter, who's played pretty well for a rookie. Mm -hmm. um, and Stingley has been phenomenal, I think, for Houston. Yeah. Uh, to, to see those type of scores is encouraging. I think, yeah, wheels up going forward makes sense. I'm pretty wary of the Jets as a whole, as an organization, the offensive <laughs> yeah, line, yes. everything. I would, yeah. not, I would not take a job for them, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh and aaron Rodgers, i think you could lump him into that don't necessarily trust uh that but i do trust gary wilson man i think that guy's the truth um that's easy yeah. to say after last week but i've been saying it all along i believe yeah. in this guy he's awesome yeah transcendent play truly transcendent the jump i mean the jump man the the similarity to the jump man logo which for us is like mythological almost <laughs> you know we grow up in the age of air jordan and that pose implies like breaking the bounds of gravity basically yeah you know and <laughs> and for him to do that on that touchdown the, and i don't care if it was a really a touchdown or not it was a touchdown okay it counted it counted because mm -hmm. it changed the course of his season you know yeah. it changed the course of fantasy seasons and that's how things happen in the nfl it doesn't happen incrementally it doesn't happen like a straight line you know it's a big big bends in these curves and you're trying to catch that wave uh and sometimes it's just that simple of when you watch something it makes you go wow you want to be part of that and you don't ask that many more questions about it. Um, uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, there's, there's, there, I'm looking at stuff again. So, okay. Okay. 
I'll, 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 I'll give you, uh, how about this, Jacob? I'll, I'll tee you up like, like an either or, like you get to pick one of two. And the, and the, and the topic here is pass offenses that could be a lot better in the second half than they were in the first half of the season. Okay. Yeah, we're looking for buying opportunities uh, in, in terms of you know a little more nitro boost for our fantasy teams. Okay, and there's signs here for both of these. Which offense, pass offense, do you think is more likely to stay outperforming expectations? The Los Angeles Chargers or the Pittsburgh Steelers? I'm going to go with the Chargers. Um, I I think both teams like kind of coming into their own as the season goes on makes a lot of sense and so i think it's a really good question um but i just have so much more faith in herbert than i do in russ (laughs) um (laughs) i think herbert is playing phenomenally and i do think it makes some sense that pat fitzmorris just brought this up i was on him with a fantasy pro show right before this he it was just a good reminder that he had the list frantic injury I think people kind of forgot about it i almost kind of forgot about it i was like oh yeah like that totally makes sense he was eased in and now we're seeing the team is throwing a lot more coming out of the week five by their pass rate over expectation has been above average in three straight games. Um, their rate over the past three games would rank fourth, I think, overall, like over the course of yeah. the full season. In yes. terms of Greg Roman can pass rate. Uh, like learn a new trick. Right. Surprising, but uh, definitely exciting. We'll see if it sustains, but it has been three straight games. And I think it makes sense because you got Justin Herbert, man, and he's playing phenomenally. You have Lad McConkey. That guy is so much, so much fun to watch. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, I said Josh Downs, one of my favorite players. McConkie is the closest I've seen to Downs. Maybe even better in terms of start stop, just like uncanny mm-hmm. start stop ability. Um, he's he's just shot out of a cannon like on any given play. He's so cool. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go with the Chargers. The tackles are playing well. I think I think it makes sense that they could be yeah. uh, a fantasy gold mine here down the stretch. Oh yeah, I th- I think that's probably and you you led with I think the most compelling part is it's Herbert. I mean you're putting a chip on Herbert, but also Harbaugh and Roman. I mean remember what they did with I bring this up all the time. Remember what they did with Colin Kaepernick? Do you remember the time that yeah. Colin Kaepernick was like a franchise quarterback? That was Harbaugh and Roman and Herbert. There's so much more there to work with as far as passing. And remember what everybody said? They have to get a receiver. They have to get a receiver. They didn't everything. They, well, they did. They got Lad McConkey, um, but they didn't like get some big uh, receiver at the top of the draft. They took an offensive tackle, like you said, that's big. And yeah, I think I don't think you could go wrong. I, I mean, Quentin Johnson's available for pennies. Josh Palmer's available for pennies. It was busted coverages, but I brought this up on, on the show earlier, Jacob. How many times are we watching games and we shake our fists because the the quarterback didn't see him? He's wide open. Well, J- Justin Herbert saw them and hit them Mm -hmm. and they got long touchdowns and they're going to continue to get those kinds of opportunities because of how good the running game is because Harbaugh and Roman understand scheming the run to set up the pass. And, and the last thing you mentioned is really compelling too. What Herbert had like a 40 yard run two weeks ago, right? Mm. I mean, his foot's fine and he's athletic and they're not afraid to use him. Going back to Drake May thing really quick. The, one of the things you mentioned, Drake May, such a prolific, uh, runner for fantasy football and i believe he's barely used as a runner by design that there's not a lot of running by design it's scrambling he's a gifted scrambler he's got the field vision for it and herbert though i think the chargers could use really mix him in as a runner by design because of how he's built and because he's feeling good i still jacob i kind of think oh i don't know if he ran the afc playoffs 10 times chargers might make the super bowl once I love it. I love it. I think it I think it could happen. Their defense is playing really, really well. Um, and I do think Herbert is that guy. Yeah, his scramble rate is up uh, pretty significantly over the past four weeks. I'm just checking on that right now. Mm-hmm. His designed run rate is pretty high. I, before the injury this summer, speculated on like maybe he's somebody who could sneak into like six, seven, eight rushing touchdowns based off what we've seen from Roman in the past. Um, the guy who I would bring up is like, you know, I called it a gold mine, and it's like, who, how actionable is that? Who is there really other than McConkey? I think Kamani Vidal. Oh yeah, is a really interesting player. Um, he's clearly the backup now. He can play on passing downs, so he can play all three d- downs at Troy. And J.K. Dobbins 
has to go like oh. 12 or 14 straight weeks. Yeah, I don't know, say yeah, it. I, I know. I know. Like, I don't even it's want to say it with Kyron Williams. Like, so like Blake Corum, Kamani Vidal. We talked about Isaac Arendo. Like, you don't want to speak this stuff out into the universe, but the, you need to go right now. Like pause the show, go and see if they're on the waiver wire. Make sure because what people need to be thinking about right now is what's the best case scenario. I don't care if it's a 1% chance, although that's also why we're talking about these guys, J.K. Dobbins. I want him to stay healthy forever. I want him to be playing football when he's 50 years old, okay? But and he, he's he been getting a full workload, something we've never seen him. Bigger hold workload under. than ever, yeah. yeah. Bigger workload than he's ever had. In the NFL, right? And he's had two catastrophic injuries. I mean, the Achilles, and I love the Achilles brigade, Justice Hill, Cam Akers. Akers is another one, by the way. Looked fine last week. And mm -hmm. Aaron Jones, and I love Aaron Jones. Great dude. Um but he's not known for playing 17 games in a season. I think he might have already missed a game this year. So it's so you need to be thinking about these players because at, at least one out of those four is going to matter in fantasy leagues. It might be the reason that people win a championship. Uh, so this is so important in fantasy football. We just see it so many times. And they're also all attached to good running games. Mm hmm. So the, I always say when you're looking at backup running backs, like which backup running back should I carry? You know, there's the talent of the player. There's a, do we, are, is it clear that they're the sole backup? How good is the offense? And look at the player ahead of them. Is there a way the door could open via injury or otherwise? Travis Etienne getting, I guess, benched. Oh boy. So, you know, there's other ways sometimes that the backup running back can have value, but uh, it's fun to talk about the chargers, but here's, I'm going to make the case for the Steelers and not just because I'm a Steelers fan, um, but the Steelers, first half schedule was not like their second half schedule <laughs> um the first half schedule atlanta denver chargers indy dallas vegas jets giants second half schedule washington baltimore cleveland cincy cleveland philly baltimore kansas city <laughs> i mean it couldn't be more different in terms of the game scripts the steelers are not mm -hmm. going to you're not going to be feeding Najee harris 20 plus carries in games against baltimore and Cincinnati, I think, and, and, and against Kansas City, you know, I, I mean, Washington this week, Philadelphia, it's good. More is going to fall on Russell Wilson's shoulders. That means more is going to fall on George Pickens shoulders. Uh, so and Jalen Warren is another guy. Go check and make sure he's not on the waiver wire coming off of his bye because he's the passing back and he's good. You know, the, uh, rewind three months ago, we were pretty excited to take Jalen Warren. He's nine. really good. You know, he's yeah. a good football player. Forget about undrafted. He's a good football player. And if the Steelers game scripts get him on the field more and hurry up drives and come back garbage time type scripts and things like that, we know Russell Wilson will throw the running back a ton, you know, if it's Jalen Warren out there. So they're both good. The answer's both. Hey, <laughs> the answer's both, really. But I like to put this stuff under the uh, the microscope. And we, like you said, do something about it. Do something actionable. Is there anything actionable other than just cry when we think about the Cowboys offense without Dak Prescott? No, no, I've got nothing for you. I'm sorry. And I'm heavily invested in Dak and CeeDee Lamb. It's brutal. I mean, would you trade away CeeDee Lamb? And redraft? I guess. I mean, it depends what you get for him. Um, if you can get, let's let's try George to think Pickens. of some guys. Yeah, yeah. I think I Lab think that, that could make sense given the schedule you just laid out with Pittsburgh probably being pass heavy. McConkey, that's tough. I really like McConkey. I like his schedule. Um, I don't think I would go. Eric Wilson. Far. Yeah. Slam dunk. Yeah, like you don't even have to think about that. Awesome, awesome schedule for the Jets. I mean, we could probably sit here. Let's do. Let's have, let's have some fun, Jacob. Let's just do this real quick. Um, I'm just going to toss out some names. Okay, we'll say PPR league. Okay, um, CD Lamb. I'm, I'm really just going to see where the line is. This is one of those. Let's see where the line is. I'm just going down teams. Um, CD Lamb or Khalil Shakir. Lamb, and I think it's also this is this is all contextual based on your team and where you're at. If you ha have a good team, who uh, you're seven and two or six and three or whatever. I think you just hold because in the fantasy playoffs you get Carolina and then Tampa Bay and then Philadelphia. But his Dak awesome match play in the fantasy playoffs. I I think you think he's they'll shut him down. Why would they, if he's like they're like three and eight? Why? Yeah, yeah. Jeez. Okay, I love uh, I love Shakir, but I'm going Lamb. Okay, so, uh, C D Lamb or Tyreek Hill. Hill. C D Lamb or Josh Downs. Lamb. This is so brutal. No, no, it's a good one. CD Lamb or Nico Collins? Nico. Yeah, okay, so there's one, right? CD Lamb or Zay Flowers? 
flowers. Right. We said Pickens is like almost like the break point. Like, ah, oh, I don't know. I mean, like, yeah. you're thinking about it, right? Lamb versus Pickens. Yeah. Um, um, I guess Lamb for Hopkins is probably overthinking it because you can get Hopkins plus. So that's not even yeah. out there. Um, Lamb or McLaurin? I'll go Terry. See, I mean, so yeah. I mean, the, there's a list here. Like, we're getting to the where there's a list. I think, a list. I think it's like Ross, Mar- St. Brown. Lamb or uh, St. Brown. I think St. it's Brown. like Marvin Harrison Jr., Brian Thomas Jr. kind of guys is where I'm at, where it's like pretty much a toss up for me. Yeah. So th- the list is not short. I, I mean, let me put it this way you can probably trade CD Lamb for a lot of these guys today. Like, if you're listening to the show and you're in a redraft league, I hate it, man. Uh, hey, take this guy's I mean, second overall. <laughs> that's exactly why you can still trade him for players no. that are highly likely to outproduce him. Highly likely, you know. Um, but maybe I'm just gloom and bloom and doom here. But <laughs> well, I mean, so for, for instance, I'm telling people like just drop Dak Prescott in redraft leagues. I mean, there's yeah. no reason to hold Dak Prescott. You know, I mean, I guess with Colt with Rico Dowdle and Jake Ferguson because they're going to get like lots of sugar high, like garbage times kind of stuff. Go ahead. I want to talk. I want to talk about Jalen Waddle. He was a name I almost brought up that you. <laughs> so, I know you'd have to get. You could get a lot more. Um, but I think I think I think we need to zoom out with Jalen Waddle. Um, where, can I get your takes on it first? I'm curious. What Please you do. Think about it. Well, no, 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 no. You go first. You go first. Why don't yeah, I, let's, let's say about Jay, well, okay, look, I, 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 I'll say what I say first so that your ears will be more of a counterpoint, or maybe you'll say like, oh, wow. So I, I made a mistake this year because I really thought in the second round, I mean, I thought Nico was a good pick. I thought Jalen Waddle was a good pick, you know. Mm-hmm. And I thought that with Tyreek Hill doing what he's doing, that the, the Jalen Waddle, I mean, Jalen Waddle, here's the problem fumbling over my words i'm not sticking to the point we have never gotten to see what a true fully healthy for a sustained time jalen waddle can do in the nfl we probably never will don't say that (laughs) but if we've had a large enough sample size if he was going to be able to stay healthy through the rigors of a season wouldn't it have happened already i mean it did kind of in his rookie year when he got all those targets before they got to uh you know what i mean though I mean, because going into the year, I was like, well, my one hesitation was he just can't seem to stay off the injury report. Like, you're always mm-hmm. wondering, is he really full speed, you know? Yeah. Um, and and I, th- I think it's kind of played like, oh, that way again this year. Yeah. Well, my points are going to be based off of his per route production and stuff like that, which, you know, is a way for me to weasel around the injury problems. <laughs> no. Uh, well, because you might be able to say like, this is why he's compelling because when mm-hmm. he's healthy, this is how, comp- this is how much Tua likes to throw to him and what he does with it. Mm-hmm. I think it's just, so what I would say with Waddle is like, let's try to see the forest for the trees here and not forget who he is, not lose sight of who he is. He was extremely, extremely productive in college um as both a deep threat and a yak guy um we're talking about like since 2020 highest yard per route run rate of any receiver that includes Devonte smith who is widely considered maybe the best receiver to ever play college football um jamar chase is in there cd lamb is in there puka nakua is in there with his crazy yard per route run rates um waddles was better than all of them he's had a thousand yards every year of his career including his rookie season and he was drafted sixth overall this guy is insanely insanely good and so just keep that in mind. Like, mm-hmm. I think it's really easy in the midst of a season to get really microanalyzing, even to the point where it's like some of us aren't touching grass at all. And we're sitting and watching the games that we're so stressed out that through three quarters, Jalen Waddle isn't even on the stat sheet at all. And let that really influence things where it's like, that's crazy, right? Like, think of it. Just think about that for a second. Like, I'm not saying that it's not important to watch the games and be aware of what's happening and all that. Like, I'm not saying that last week's game wasn't discouraging, but if you were just out doing anything else on a Sunday and you came back and saw you had 10 points or whatever, you'd be like, okay, you know, another bad game. But instead you have this flavor in your mind of like, ah, the team isn't using him. He has zero. He has zero. He has zero. We're talking about a partial game, not even a a full game. And that's what's really affecting things here with the recency bias is like one game, four games, eight games. It's been bad. But we have so many other games that show that he's a really, really good player. And then even if we do want to microanalyze these games, um, you've got four games without two. You can basically throw those out because it's not even a real functional offense at all. Like probably the worst offense we've seen this year was those four games. In the four games with Tua, they played the Bills twice and the Cardinals once. And those are just not normal defenses at all. 
really unique matchups. The Cardinals have the lowest opponent first read target rate, only 63%. The next lowest is 67%. They invite you to throw the ball to the running backs. They invite you to beat them with the run. They have the highest light box rate in the NFL, meaning six or fewer defenders up on the line of scrimmage. Um, so I think intuitively, yeah, it makes sense that we see a ton of Devon Achan in that matchup. Same thing with the Bills. The Bills have the highest opponent running back target rate in the NFL, the lowest opponent wide receiver target rate in the NFL. Last year, same defense, Sean McDermott and everything. This is just kind of what they do. Third lowest opponent wide receiver target rate, sixth lowest opponent first read target rate for the Bills defense. So that's three of the four games for Waddle this year with Tua is the Bills and the Cardinals. The other game, he had 109 yards. Um, I just I think it's possible that like we're we're just being a bit dramatic here. Yeah. People are talking about dropping Jalen Waddle and stuff. Are you too. saying I'm dramatic? Well, I am. <laughs> I'm very dramatic. I, um, no, and you're right. And I think everything you laid out is important and exactly the kind of analysis you should be doing, which is to say, is the sample size we've gotten from Jalen Warren, the Jalen Waddle, sorry, um, the a valid sample size? Does it represent the sample that we're going to have going forward? And you're right. I, I'm probably being a little bit harsh because of how rough it is when Tua was out. You know, I'm watching him get stepped on, like Demar Hamlin stepped on him last week, and he's limping on the crate again. You know, uh, but the reality is, he is really good at football, and we just need Tua to stay on the field. And this week, Monday night, Rams Dolphins, that could be a really fun game for fantasy football. Mm -hmm. Shootout yeah. expected, yeah. and that that's a defense where you can attack wide receivers. We just saw Jackson Smith yeah. and Jigbed. 180 yards. Well, isn't, is that sticking? Is that going to stick? There's no stats that are going to tell us this. Is that going to stick? Yeah, who knows? I think he's capable of doing it, you know, for what it's worth. I don't know if I think the problem has been that the offensive line is inept. And, oh. so, and, and so they haven't. But they're getting a little bit healthier. But because of this, I don't think Ryan Grubb's been able to do what he would like to do in attacking down the field. But if you wanted to say long term, is that going to stick? I think it's definitely possible, if maybe even likely, because I, I think Jackson Spinach Cuba really is. He's not the player that he's been used. He's been typecast as as like a slot catch and run guy. Ugh. He's he's really slippery off the line. He's really hard for defenses to get their hands on, and he can beat people down the field. He's a really really good route runner, really good at tracking the ball and like keeping people off of him and being able to make catches along the sideline. Um, I think what we saw was legit. I don't know if for this year what if you can expect that to sustain just because i don't know if the infrastructure around him is going to be able to support it yeah you're going to keep playing him i have a my rule is usually like he that kind of performance means you have to have two duds in a row before we bench you and then you go off again after you get the the, the two duds in a row right that's how it always works out okay before we yep. go <laughs> off the rails jacob anything else any other thing you want to stand here with the uh, couch audience and just say well i've got your ear uh anything else you want to call people's attention to Hmm. No, we've hit on a lot here. Like Drake May is somebody I would have definitely yes. brought up, awesome. but I'm psyched that we, that we talked about yeah. that. And, it, and it's beyond the box score, which is a great name for, and, it's, yeah. and Dan Schneier, who I love Dan, yeah. what's up? Dan's going to be on the couch. Do you tell Dan he's, he's his invitation is coming. Um, Good. Uh, we're all about it. CBS sports and you're in, uh, and, uh huh. I, subscribe to the FFT newsletter. If you Google FFT newsletter, or Jacob Gibbs newsletter, I write it. It's free six days a week. Um, if you like some of the more like talking about matchups, we, like we just did with Jalen Waddle, that's what I'm trying to do is just contextualize everything and help you better understand the game. Um, maybe not be so like rage quitty about stuff with <laughs> Jalen Waddle and stuff like that, you know, just have a better idea of what's going on because it is crazy. It's chaotic uh, week to week and trying to keep up with every game is is sick, um, but it's something that I do. Um, and so yeah, I try yeah. to help help you better right. be able to to feel a little bit more confident in your decisions and so yeah that's free fft newsletter six days a week it's it's dope cecil like to say well, you we don't have a life you do <laughs> <So> <laughs> subscribe to our newsletter uh exactly. and we'll, we're, we're, we'll watch all that stuff for you um this uh, awesome this is awesome and you're also uh, we talked about this before the show uh, you're from the lineage of heath cummings who is uh from the lineage of football guys and also the couch and it's awesome cbs everybody over at cbs dave richard everyone over at cbs is awesome and it's really fun to have everybody over here on the couch okay i guess i'll start here and i mean you have to come back because i've got so many questions for you jacob and, and i've been doing something and i'm not going to do this to you because this is your first time here but um, my man, Alan Seslowski, what's up, Alan, did this for, he just, I paused for a second. He said, I'm going to ask you a question, uh, but I'm not going to do that to you. Um, I'll, I'll ask. Okay, well, go, go ahead then. Go ahead. 
Yeah. Now I watched last last week's show with Scott, and so I thought about it. Like, what what I would ask Sigmund Bloom. I'm curious how you maintain sanity, stay level headed, um, not only amidst the chaos of the NFL, but also like the fantasy football streets, man. Uh, Twitter, wow. just ha having to be on Twitter. If if it were up to me, I would not be online hardly at all. <laughs> Um, but we kind of have to yeah, be. That's smart. So, like, Everybody out there, that's smart. Yeah. During the off season, I sign off. You, you're not going to find me. <laughs> um, but yeah, Sigmund, you, you've yeah. you've stood the test of time, and I think that's really impressive. Sometimes I wonder if I'm going to be able to. Uh, so, do you do you have any wisdom you would impart on how to just you know maybe take yeah. things lightly, uh, not take anything personally? How do, how do we do this? How right. do we navigate here? Yeah. Well, again, Cecil, never too far from my mind, you know, Cecil would say like Twitter's not real life, you know? Um, no, I, I think for, I've been for fortunate sure. because um, I've been really fortunate, Jacob, because I have like my, my, I, I'm not trying to, I, I let, I let other people say things about me. I try, I'm trying to, you know, well, let me own, say something about you then therapy. Go ahead. Go ahead. Not only survive, which is kind of what I post here, but thrive, I think. I think you are able to maintain mm -hmm. like good vibes, which is really cool. Right. Personally, I get I get I'm online too much. I get a little bent out of shape. I get a little frustrated with people, you know, and then I don't want to go on there. Um, but like I think it's oh, really yeah. cool that you're able to like keep those good vibes rolling and bring people in that you know will like kind of reciprocate that energy. So like, yeah, just you take it anyway. Well, and I've been lucky because I think that, and yeah, thank you for saying that because then I don't have to sound like I'm like patting myself on the back or something and saying like, I think that I tried to just be like friendly and inclusive and just enjoy people. I'm a New Orleanian now. Like we just enjoy people. Let's enjoy each other. That's what we do on the couch. Let's just enjoy each other for a little bit. And I've been able to draw people to me for the most part. There are always little moments here and there. There was the one time I said I wouldn't take Tom Brady top five if I was starting a team from scratch. Oh, boy. The, 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 <laughs> the Massachusetts folks come out, um, you know. So every now and then, I'll accidentally do that thing on the internet where you draw people and like, why is everybody do? You know, like, but this is the thing where you put the uh, stick in the bicycle. Oh, blah, you know, I just shot off some ignorant take about Tom Brady, and everybody's coming for me with the long knives and the pitchforks. But people have been really kind, and it makes it easy to stay in that space. And um, I think that it, you know, it's just something we, I think, you learn as you like your life goes on. And I'm gonna then pivot and ask you uh something based on this is you know you just energy like energy is going to draw like energy and we see that play out in our fantasy football space however out in the fantasy football streets like you say i mean i i'm i'm happy to say you know, i got on twitter in 2009 what's up mark filetti my one-time business partner my one-time work husband um did a lot of awesome stuff with him and he explained twitter to me in 2009 and i was like well okay he's like just do it and it was i mean i love twitter because i'm a compulsive talker surprise and uh it gives you the illusion that someone's listening when you yammer on and on and on that's wonderful for me um but getting back there in 2009 the fantasy football community was still innocent i mean it wasn't an industry it was just people hanging out talking about football who like were trying to like make some money on the side so they could do it instead of real work some people who had figured out how to make businesses out of it dfs came into the picture pretty soon after that and so on it started to change but even through like 2015 2016 2017 it was still friendly it was still really friendly and then it became an industry and then it became really competitive and then people found all kinds of ways to like game the system or like jump ahead in line or it's your success isn't necessarily based on the quality of your content or building an audience or your community or your platform it could be based on algorithms and oh, thre threads and i don't even know what um, so it's gotten a tougher and there's just more competition for fewer spots and fewer dollars. And then some company will buy up of somebody, some company and some other small company and lay everybody off. And now there's more people competing for fewer jobs. Um, and I think getting offline is, is great, honestly, and touch some grass, as they say, um, you know, get in touch with nature, even though, like you say, we kind of have to do it. So I'm going to pivot and ask you, speaking about vibes, how are you so calm? How are you so calm, Jake? <laughs> uh so i am like super into yoga on the side oh. i think that helps me a lot like yoga meditation and all that um you see the shirt here you you kind of get and <laughs> piece it together yeah uh i don't know if i can talk about all of it as a cbs employee but like there are sure, <laughs> ways sure. Sure. to keep yes. uh keep yourself calm keep your mind yeah like yes and uh also i, I brought up like not taking it personally i think that's a huge thing um, and something that's helped me a lot is I used to take a lot of pride in my work and not that I don't now. Um, but like I would take pride in being right or wrong 
Um, and I was right a lot. I would always try to be right and do the absolute best I could uncover every stone and everything. Um, and I found ultimately that you can't always be right. That's just a pit that you're going to fall into a pit of like wanting validation, um, and trying to like outsource your validation to success or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. and so ultimately, like, where do you find your validation? It's you, like you, if you know you're doing the best work you can, it's trust the process. It's all of that, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's kind of where I'm at with it is like, I don't attach any like personal value to what the players do and whether I'm right or wrong, because it's a truly like chaotic game. Like, yeah. even when you're right, he's hurt. Even when you're right, it's a random blowout or whatever, you know, like there's so much stuff you can't control. And so when I'm wrong about Saquon Barkley this year as a fade, you know, I don't you don't get bent out of shape about it. It doesn't have anything to do with me. Like there was stuff that I couldn't have expected. He looks more athletic than maybe he ever has oh in his gosh. career. He looks like you the know? most athletic player in the whole NFL. I couldn't have predicted that. There's no way. Like, um, and so you want to evaluate the process. Was there something wrong with my process? Maybe. And that's something I'll think about more, but like, I'm not going to let it bother me. Like you want, I want to enjoy what Saquon's doing. You would be, have to be a psycho to not enjoy what Saquon is doing out there on the field because of your own personal, whatever, Right. Um, Lad McConkey. Like I, I was not super confident in McConkey for a few reasons, but then I watch him as a pro and I'm like, holy crap, this guy's awesome. This is one yeah. of the most fun players in the NFL right now. So like, it's not about me. It's about him. And like, so here's what he's doing. And I'm, it doesn't matter what my take was. Uh, that's funny. That's a funny question. The, the, why are you so calm? No. I think that's why. No, I, I like it. I mean, I think you, something I don't think it's ever come up on the show and it's perfect for on the couch thank you is a good test for your like spiritual health via fantasy football is when someone's doing something that should spark joy if it doesn't help your fantasy team or you were wrong about it can you still experience the joy and you yeah. lose if you can't it's right just as simple as like well if you can't then you're loss um but there's so many things on, on any given week that spark joy and fantasy football gives us something to get us really engaged in fantasy football but when you're watching the game you should still be like in the moment and letting that wash over you and like you said not um, not defining it by like, well, does this make me look smart or not? Uh, no, just let's just watch people trying to transcend every week, like Garrett Wilson. And, and you mentioned, um, cause I know I get on my father's birthday, Sigmund O. Bloom. I'll mention, you know, um, he was a compulsive gambler. I'm probably a compulsive gambler. And I just put it into fantasy football. So I'm a compulsive talker now. Uh, and he, he took me to gamblers anonymous meetings with him. And I want to mention in this moment, if any of you, cause boy, sports gambling is everywhere now. Um, if anybody wants to talk like off the record to like somebody who, you know, I'm here not to judge you. I'm here to help you really. Um, you all know how to find me. If you ever want to talk about this subject, and the gamblers and honest meeting, 12, 12 step programs. And really like, if you could just give someone one spiritual, emotional, psychological piece of advice, the serenity prayer is pretty good, pretty good. You know, um, change the things you can, you know, accept the things you can not have the wisdom to know the difference. That's a pretty much a compass for life. And guess what? We can't, change what happens on the football field we can change like our, our work or our energy in our work or how we do our work but let it go and just enjoy it whether it makes you profit or not and do yoga which is awesome and get into all the stuff behind the yoga because it's spiritual because it's not just and it feels good and it's great but also beyond that there's a story that helps you understand us and help you understand our, yourself uh hopefully and that's what we do here and it's really great it's really great seriously jacob everybody that i have on from cbs i love them um and I, dan you're next uh and heath soon your turn's gonna come again soon and dave your turn's gonna come again soon um everybody thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to do this it is a privilege it is a pleasure uh and it is a joy and we get to serve you if you weren't out there then there would be no us and we wouldn't get to do this uh we love serving you because you're classy and again today i will say this is something that came plink out of my brain or through the cosmos to my brain a few years ago that helps me and it is that you don't get to pick the story that you're born into but you get to pick the role that you play in it